they're going to be talking about the legal instruments with uh, Europe and Latin America to know about the contractual relationships between the countries derived uh, from the conflicts of uh, COVID. I'm talk about this speaker. He is a public accountant, graduated from the National Polytechnic. He uh, has a BA in laws with a master in administrative and fiscal law graduated from the attorney's uh, bar and also he belongs to the College of Fiscal Specialists. He studied international law in uh, Coverini University in Italy. He has a master's degree in business administration. He has wide experience in everything related to accounting and law. Also, he is the head of uh, intellectual planning, advisor of the Venezuela company. Many of you know who I am talking about. I'm done talking about Vicente Ortiz Justiz who I'd like to welcome. And it's a pleasure to listen to you, Professor. The thing is, I cannot share my screen.
Sorry for the technical issues. So we're going to get started. Uh, OK, so let's go to the first one. Oh, first and foremost, thank you. And sorry for this technical delay today. I'm going to talk about uh, shared uh, law. Because of COVID-19, we have another phenomenon in the social uh, changes that have break the, the, in, the sovereignty, international communication, break all the barriers of the political division of the countries. Therefore, the link that exists between trade relationships between state and companies is becoming in a common practice. So as advisors, as a consult consultant or as a firm, we take part in those trade negotiations in the contract uh, uh, preparation. And we are helping the relationship between companies and countries. And since then, we need to analyze and we need to touch on the situation of links between individuals and entities when we want to manage the legislation. And we, are, we face a particular phenomenon that is the shared uh, law. Currently, 
many of our provisions or oral trials, not only in Mexico, but in all countries, there are some words that we have used like compliance. Uh, the terminology that comes from the Anglo-Saxon law, that it's a discipline, it has uh, Anglican English root, and that is why we are uh, adopting this in our Germanic uh, law. But when we face international issues, there's always a risk of controversy. So we need to have a mechanism by which we can analyze how similar are the things we have with other countries when it comes to relationships. But in the legal part or in the accounting part, we always think about the treaties to avoid the dual taxation. When we have a customer, uh, they can pay the twice as much in taxes because the payment made to that country uh, will not be recognized. So the thing is to avoid to pay taxes in both countries. So in order to frame all the treaties, the international treaties, they have to start with a common effect, like an agreement in common. And those start in the initiatives of the treaties signed by the international countries, the agreements, or the uh, additions that we do in conventions. So where we have to start the shared uh, law by knowing how the state is and how they function in terms of constitutionality to see if the treatments recognize each other based on leg legislation in order to participate or coadjuvant in the relationships between two states. So we are going to review this. There are things that are more involved with law, but in some way we need to analyze in a simple way. What are we going to compare? What What's a compared law? The comparison of any uh, rule or law, the type of state, the form of government, the constitutional standards, the control of constitutionality, the control of legality, and the control of conventionality, and how this is all integrated into the jurisdictional system in each one of the states to see where we're going to converge or to establish the guidelines in case of a controversy and to know what are the defense of dispute uh, mechanism solution we will have. That doesn't mean that we have the that we do not have the international mediation as a mechanism of uh, dispute solution. So because of all the things that have been happening around the world and based on other countries, we need to be analyzing and study the links so to for us to see if we can coincide or participate with the countries we want to make business with. So this slide shows all the comparisons and all the laws are comparable, but as individuals that provide advice, we need to start from the general to the particular. We need to start from the supreme chart and the way of government to reach the idea or legal principles and see how they can fit in an agreement of a company or in an international treaty or uh, and to understand where the 
convergences will be between two or more countries. So let's go to slide number three. So let us remember the type of state we have. So the, the, the states have certain elements in order to be constituted and it has all a territory mark, a population, a government, and sovereignty. Based on the respect and sovereignty and all the understanding in the way of the way of government, we can determine if the in the regulations of the supreme law allows us to make inter, to do international. Uh, deals or to be part of an international treaty. There's a microphone. Next uh, slide. Next. Okay. So we we analyze the types of state. This is a very simple summary. It is like the elemental uh, knowledge of law. So we have three kind of states, monarchic, democratic, and theocratic. So this is if we have a negotiation in a business activity company, probably I'm going to be misogynist, but it is an example. There are many entrepreneur women associations or companies made of women, and I want to see if they sign a clean treaty without hesitation in a theocratic state or imagine the Islam. Do you think that the Muslims can converge in this way or to have mutual agreements and having like a, a good uh, negotiation? So we need to analyze if we can or not, or we can pr presume that there's a negotiation uh, relationship. So in general terms, we are going to be talking about the monarchical, the imperialism is limited because of the parliament mechanism, but they are monarchical when there's uh, still kings in the Middle East and also the democratic part in its different aspects in America and Europe and theocratic, theocratic that is in the Middle East. And how can we do to consider those types of states if we may have a negotiation that allows us to participate and have commercial relationship with them. In all states, there's a flaw. This is the flaw when I go to the extreme as a, a dictatorship, the totalitarianism of the government, or a total abandonment of legal positions falling into anarchism. So those positions will not give uh, security to the investment. There are countries that have complained about uh, social divorce between their governments and their population because, of, because they are a dictatorship or they do not have uh, security in many aspects. So partially, there's an anarchy, even though they are in a world under a dictatorship. But if this dictator, dictatorial company uh, has flaws, uh, there's no interest to participate or invest or to have trade relationship with those countries. This is the first thing that we need to analyze in terms of knowing the states and their flaws as political institutions and, at the end, ways of government. Next.
so at the end of the day, this analysis, when we are, if we like, want to generate international relationship, we need to have a government that, like a, a timocrat, which is a class government. like democracy. Our ways of government, we will see the class government. I have an imperial or kingdom government that may have a dictatorial defect or a total dominance with no criteria options. So. Uh, King of England, since he was making decisions every 24 hours, and they were different decisions on the sa same topic, so he was asked to prepare uh, a charter th so he will be uh, have a binding relationship with with that uh, document. So the maximum power of a country and the passion of the world is reflected in the charts. And some the students of law are the ones that are in this domain. We say that our constitution, it is a, a, a charter, which is not, because we are not in a monarchy. The Germanic uh, law is based on a constitution because they start with a pact of the people where the sovereignty stays there and, and, and also the, the powers for their administration and government. So in some way, we can say that it is a social pact. It is an agreement or a contract. It is not a charter. And sometimes we call it that the Magna Carta is because this Magna Carta came from an imperial dictatorship because the decisions were based on whims. And they recognize the crown. We love you as a king, but you have to put rules so we can follow them or otherwise uh, you will be overthrown. So the Timocrats, even though it was absolutist in terms of the decision, was based in a series of agreements or laws or, or fixed uh, doctrines fixed by the king himself. This is a class government, the aristocracy. This is the government of the savants, of the prepared, educated people that have the social, political knowledge. And all the government policies are established based on a structured proposal. So this is how we live or we feel with some countries in Latin America where the aristocracy becomes oli oligarchy. So the, the people have an influence on governors and all the provisions are biased. And those uh, provisions make that at an international level, the competition um, becomes difficult between countries. If we think in a country, for example, uh, if the state uh, owns the goods and the private property is not fully uh, available, the guarantees being offered by the institution uh, with 
to another country, uh, they have guaranteed this with goods and the certainty of their le legitimate welfare to have those negotiations, they will be in disadvantage. And this is done be, uh, based on the how far uh, they are in terms of governance, the tyranny or the spotty government, because at the end of the day, they become authoritarian. Those are unilateral decisions. And as a result of this, we can say that the loss will be over and how confident we will be as businessmen or as a government or representative of companies advise our customers to have a relationship with those countries that have governments that are totally risky, so to speak, that does not give us a legal certainty before the society or individuals. And the analysis of the forms of government become essential to make all those links or suggest international relationships in terms of trade. Well, therefore, we're always used to understand that the supreme law, it is a social pact of a nation to constitute a state, and the custody is given through the control mechanism of constitutionality. The mechanism is the diffuse uh, control of in for the ones that are not familiar with this topic, but I want to explain this in simple terms. All the supreme laws in some way want to, want to guarantee that this law is not breached from the social guarantees that are part of the social pact called the Constitution. In many constitutions, there were changes, radical changes in the way they uh, draft the right to those individual rights, to those essential rights of man. Example, I want, I will dare to talk about our constitution in Mexico. From the beginning, it says that all Mexicans will have individual rights uh, that this constitution grants it. So apparently, in this semantic of the definition, we saw like uh, an equal position. So all the citizens will be granted individual rights provided by this constitution, but putting emphasis on the draft. And we separate it. And we give like a human seal, like to personalize it. We would say that the constitution that grant the individual rights because uh, it was decided by it. it is, uh, this is how our constitution was and the effects of the international conflicts that went to the Inter-American Court. So they saw the recommendation of international organisms and they highlighted that we were wrong because I don't want to use other words. I'm not going to risk myself to use a bad word. But they consider that we were still very well below a universal reasoning of human rights. So we changed the drafting of the article first of that all citizens will be granted the rights that this constitution recognizes. The one was granting it, and in while it was uh, was granting me the the guarantees, and the other ones need to recognize them because in internationally wise, the rights has 
uh, are belong to the human being because of the fact of existing. So it, they shouldn't. It is not an obligation of the constitution of the Constitution to grant them. This is a right that is implicit, that recognizes the human being, that he's, he has or she has the right of having those rights from birth. And so this is in our Constitution as in Mexico, something similar happened in different constitution so the position of the supreme law that is a constitution in order to defend those human rights and everything that is inside in the individual rights of man that is reflected in the supreme law of a country, there's control mechanism of constitutionality. It's a diffuse system known as American system that in some way any judge can interpret the constitution, but it's going to be distributed in different uh, courts or instances by the different uh, organs of the administration. So at some point, we see uh, reasoning of yes or no, a miscompliance of the fundamental rights of humans. Every case that we have a conflict in those states that manage a diffuse system in the mechanism of constitutionality. What is diffuse is to be dispersed. So it goes to different organs and different instances, and each instance will highlight in the matters of values and human rights and breaches in the Constitution, something that is contrary to the system that is concentrated. Can you go to the, can we go to the next slide, please? And the concentrated system is one of the that we have not only in the Americas but also in, in some European countries where the Germanic uh, right has reference or it is the law that has uh, ruled uh, many generations. So we have. Uh, jurisdictional uh, department that will be in charge of surveilling the respect of human rights or fundamental rights, whatever you want to call it, and this is, uh, th and the others will vent other aspects, and many of the courts, mainly the ones that are fiscal courts, when we go to a trial, a fiscal trial. We call it a voidance judgment. It's grouped like a tax trial. In a system, we have it at jurisdictional courts. We see the legality, that is, breaches to secondary of the Constitution. And when, when we see that the discrepancy is not complete according to the judgment, then we have the famous habeas corpus or amparo judgment in order to have this resolution, and then I am going to reclaim to come to that result that you were breaching human rights, and therefore you will do it by this recourse to defend constitutionality and good exercise of human rights observance. In this sense, we already saw 
that in those centralized systems, we have a separation of some courts for legality or lawfulness and some others for constitutionality. And this could be the key part in this system. You see legality and what's going to be changing is criteria or superior orders that correct inconformities based on the same facts and dealing with these matters since the beginning. If it was already considered by a previous trial, it will be considered in next trials. So, as an example of what I am saying, we have some differences, and this is in Roman law, and these are semantics with some variants that are slight, only in terms of name. Germany, for example, look at this very particular section. I am considering some countries that are robust in economic and social terms regardless of the opinion that you can have. They have some particular points. In general terms, we may say that Germany was constituted. Sorry, we have several people speaking at the same time. Hold on a second. He's already muted. So we're going to continue. See that Germany constitution, among many others, has a difference of three years younger than ours. There's lack of procedural experience. I can speak about the Italian one because I was living there. However, the important thing is to underline that the parliament, the management of governance bodies is integrated by a prime minister or chancellor. That's the main role. And there are some courts, legality and constitutional courts similar to ours. The legality are the administrative one or first instance. And then you have collegiated or supreme court to see constitutionality. So there are some similarities. How do they regulate constitutionality? Legality courts have advisors or counselors. In many countries of uh, America, we don't have that. I didn't have the chance to analyze all of them, but I took a sample from America and Europe. In the case of Italy, we have a parliament, like the Congress in Mexico. And we have legality courts or administrative courts. As you can see at the end, we have a concentrated control, but semantics are different. Italy has a constitution of 1947, less than 30 years as the one in Mexico. But they have a procedural on experience. Many countries in Europe underwent this circumstance. The Second World War that made them have a lot of changes. Italy was with the Napoleon Code, and then 
the Second World War. And then Mussolini. And then they modified their structure to such an extent that when they had their procedural changes, the Constitution is involved with agreements of the European Union. They had not finished with that when we had the European Union. In the procedural world, we know if most of courts in America, the judge, the secretary, the magistrate and the project judge, all of them are lawyers. In Italy, only the judge is a lawyer. The rest have some bureaucratic studies of jurisdictional nature. So, on their way and conflict resolution, there are many deficiencies. So the defense has an advantage because of all the mistakes that are made. So they can point out errors of the judge. And if violence is well controlled, it's OK but not in those countries where violence is high. But the corruption in courts was high due to all the procedural deficiencies. So they were behind. Now, when we are talking about violations of rights, we need to use international courts. If we agree that matters are resolved by the parties in a country where we have deficiencies, then we're going to be affected with international cases we're talking about many zeros or economic cost. That's why it is so important to know structures, defense of structures. I'm talking about constitutionality. In order to analyze normativity in private law. So we also have an issue with the language. So when we are getting involved with different laws, we have problems. Obviously, we're going to hire a local lawyer, but probably this is going to have some problems because of conflicts of interest. So we need to look for, first, that we're not going to have double taxation among the businesses. The government type is going to keep reasonable security. And number three, that the link based on the Constitution has provisions that reflect a control of constitutionality, having the knowledge of international treaties. The executive branch signs these agreements. So, there is some subjection to the parliament or the senate. They give the final authorization to come into force with this treaty. So we need to analyze. And therefore, we go step by step 
and are certain about international negotiations with other country. Next slide, please. Please, if you want, I can move the slides by myself. So we already mentioned the significance of analyzing control of constitutionality. So we have legal certainty in private law, trust in negotiations among states or corporations of different nations, and then unify contract agreements based on existing treaties. So this is an international treaty among the countries subject to public international law as part of international treaties to provide facilities to the population and negotiations among individuals. But then the convergence in negotiations of that treaty is based on the states. They can be bilateral, multilateral, etc. In many cases, as in Mexico and the North of America, we had the participation of three countries. And as I mentioned, instead of having multinational agreements, we can have one on one. And this is the agreement and unifies criteria to follow so individuals of those nations have the opportunity to subject to it and have convergence, equality in those agreements that they carry out as individuals. Now, as a clarification, I corrected my presentation, but there's a typo here. In order to identify, we have international parties and what they execute becomes an international agreement. But there are many international organizations like UNESCO, United Nations, IMF, the labor organization, and then the WHO. And as a result of Geneva, treaties, we also have international parties, the Red Cross, as you can see, is international. And it was started by a Swiss individual after some wars among France Italy, Austria, and France. So he decided to create a group of volunteers to help casualties, injured soldiers, and civilians. And they had a white back and then a cross. which is red. It is the Red Cross, International Red Cross. All countries entered. Some countries asked to have half moon due to their religion. Any other organization 
that doesn't want to use the cross, they can use a moon, or they can also use a red diamond. And the rest of the countries can use that symbol, which is this red diamond. So those are the three symbols of the same organization. That reflects the strength of this body. So when you see that half moon in red or red diamond, we're talking about the Muslim or Jewish world. Obviously, we also have the OECD that looks to support economies in this globalized world. This globalized world probably was a mistake because when one economy is affected, the negative effect of one economy is disseminated in an automatic manner and then it is like a domino effect. So all the countries are affected. Therefore, it is important for the recovery, the block economy. When a country had a problem, then they asked for international support. But in order to prevent world events, what we know is the uh, Sarban-Oxley law or some other laws, they are applied as a global law. Multiple recommendations of OECD, like to Latin America, for example, incorporating many countries to tax any inheritance. That's the recommendation of the OECD. Some countries have accepted that or they are undergoing an analysis process by the Congress. This is also our case. It is now being frozen. The truth is that any analysis exercise has been limited due to the pandemics. So most states have not been able to have all their legal aspects working. There are some other international organizations. For example, the Justice, International Court of Justice, also the Criminal International Court, for humanity crimes, criminal sanctions are applied as a second instance. In many cases, because some countries are with totalitarian regimes, they are impositive, probably that's why we need to have the Criminal International Court. And we also have the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. This is the second instance. After having the procedural part in other states, that's the respect of human rights to safeguard those aspects that probably are vulnerable or with 
old fashioned criteria and with no basic principle of justice. That's why we have the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So these are the bodies of international law, the main ones. They are not the only ones. They are the main ones. seems that you skipped one. As you can see, in the world of international law, we have the basis. So in practical terms, we can resolve controversies and we have the path to follow. However, many elements have to be updated, for example, in the World Health Organization. Also, due to this COVID pandemic, many countries started looking for recommendations like in the International Labor Organization. If you review this legislation, you can see that many times there's a lack of acceptance to international law. In health and labor, this has happened a lot because right now are the hottest topics as a result of this health crisis. I think that right now, no generation has experienced this world pandemic as we have. Many of these organizations had different ways to follow, but the loss of each country didn't have something in place in the event of this world pandemic. Some bodies have started to analyze criteria, decisions, and experiences to have proper recommendations. We have the Vienna Agreement that has the agreements for purchase and sale contracts to be standard in the way of celebrating these international contracts and which are the main steps. As in the Vienna Agreement 1980. But since May 1969 until 1980, that was 11, sorry, 11, 20 years, 11. So there are a series of procedures and instructions as the basis to generate the rights. And the elements that all international treaties should contain, so 
all states can establish mechanisms. So you can see that back then we already had the mechanisms and we had not seen them. Finally, one of the most important things that we have in all international treaties, we have the Vienna Agreement. To start with, well, I still had 85 member countries. As I said at the beginning, currently, distances have shortened, so international integration is much more modern. Communication is practically instantaneous. As an example, this virtual meeting that we are having, we can receive notices and communications by mail. A lot of firms have been incorporated without having to travel outside of Mexico. Therefore, this is a good example on how distance barriers have been removed. We do not need a passport to have contact with abroad countries. In this way, when we need resolutions, considerations, this is going to be the guidelines. Next slide, please. Next slide contains all the Geneva agreements. As a result of the great war conflicts since the First World War and as you can see here, on August 1949, the humanitarian international law is created to resolve armed conflicts in war and as a consequence of war and protection to civilians. And also, the Nobel Prize was given to them. Agreements have been the first step to have humanitarian international law to protect civilians and injuries. Many times we cannot resolve it immediately, but at the end we have agreements to avoid more violations to human rights and also create some other agreements to avoid violation of more human rights. The most important, and this is something that I want you to think about, especially if you are not involved with international agreements. We have seen different agreements. We have the international agreement since 1961. This is of big concern for all lawyers and accountants. We have the half stamp, which is a simplified method. So in international law, affidavit, so we can recognize documents. Once they have this affidavit, they are going to be recognized as legal. 
we can have certainty abroad to documents that were generated in this way. And they are going to be taken to this government. And they have an apostille at international level, or affidavit. So in can substitute a holographic signature and the electronic record of apostates. So this is to recognize that the documents of another country or with its translation and the apostate, so to be internationally recognized, this is this method or this legislation of the apostate. You can download it on internet. Please review it to to get to know all the contracts executed with other countries when for official documents, the Constitution acts, identifications, official identification to define the legal representative of organisms. And those documents, when they reach the foreign country must get there with the right uh, apostate. In Mexico, for example, the Dominicans was issued in Mexico City. It is apostille by the Secretary of the Interior. If it's in the state, it's by the state government. In other countries, those are the Secretary of the Interior or the Chancellor, depending or when they want or where they need to go to apostille the document. Well, this is one of the items I would like to dwell on because Sometimes people ask us if they need an apostille, so you can take it to the notary public, and then we will decide which documents will have the apostille. So all the law firms create files of customers or vendors or So they collect all this information, and they, probably they are familiarized with this procedure. Or in internet, there's explanations about this. So you can see some manuals that are published online of when it comes to international law. Next slide, please. Now, so we go to Costa Rica where Fernando Muñoz is really happy because I think he wasn't born yet from the 7th to the 22nd of November 1969. The San Jose Pact was executed where uh, with the Inter-American Court of Human Rights that is made of seven judges, and it only have the option to have one judge out and sub be substituted by another. And if not, it is seven judges. And and this is from an international agreement. So in case of this diffuse control, which is on the control mechanisms of constitutionality with some resources like the Amparo, like the last uh, legal incident to protect human rights, if they, if this is an important exit and to go to the inter-American 
Court of Human Rights derived from the San Jose Pact in 1969. But it can be applied uh, internationally. This is things that caught my attention because the different countries, when they, re they recognize the level of the Constitution, if and in some way they ratify this through the parliament with the executive branch and those elements are are integrated so in some way we will have one more resource that will safeguard the guarantee to life and all the essential values next please so Unless you would like to ask a question, I don't know that this is uh, not your daily activity, but the legality as general term terminology, but my main purpose was to convey the existence or why we have international treaties and it will be affecting more and more the professional activities and that is why I wanted to convey to you. Normally, uh, today is not that I was needing more time, but I just leave like a space for questions or something that you might disagree with in this uh, session. Any comments or in the chat? Would you like to ask something, ladies, gentlemen? This is the time for you to ask. Please uh, express your concerns because Definitely, we see how the trend is changing and all the fiscal and legal issues, and it's good to have the expert online. So please, uh, if you have any comments or remarks or to congratulate or greetings, I would love to hear your voices, and we have uh, we want to thank uh, for your support by leaving your mics off. I see Aquilino Perez Puga that we will be listening to. I don't know if you have any comments or remarks. Who? Arturo Gonzalez, I just want to uh, say hello to Vicente. Everything he said is really clear. Even though we are accountants, what he explained to us was really clear. So I think there's no questions. For sure, when we will have a problem like this, we will have uh, more to ask. but. Congratulations. I think there's one question, if I'm not mistaken, in the chat. Oh, I'm sorry. I am Reinaldo Nava. I want to have a better understanding of what compliance is. Compliance first is a word like everything. The Americans have probably you know better than me, it is comply with, it is like uh, you have to, the compliance uh, right, there's the discipline of the Anglo-Saxon law that establishes in the first instance that we should have uh, compliance with everything. So when you have a compliance project, a friend of mine say, said that he was, that hired him 
and as and he was asked to establish a compliance but i need to know what are the laws that apply to you so he he read 5000 laws and official standards to summarize that 72 laws affected him once you know all the legal provisions that can affect a company or an individual Right then, you can establish, according to your activity, in the first place, you analyze risks, and then you implement a solid internal control, bulletproof, and to guarantee the information against third parties, and you establish a corporate governance. Compliance is made of of a corporate governance, risk analysis, and the internal control uh, system bulletproof. In Mexico, the fiscal control is summarized in the accounts or individualized files separated from all the accounting entries. So the compliance means that you have surveilled that all the legal provisions that will affect your entity are considered the universal model in law that the lack of knowledge of laws does not exempt you from the compliance so the first step is to know which laws apply to me and then establish the corporate governance gives certainty through a risk analysis and implement internal control and to you have an excellent act materiality because it is bulletproof because all the financial information NIF whatever you you want to call it it is uh, interpretation in a flat world and the work papers are interpreted in a flat world. The only strength of the act materiality is the paper, the invoice, the account, the account payment, everything that explicitly you make tangible and demonstrate that you can see is the one that will give support under the terms of the requirements, will give you the materiality, and this will be integrated in a process because the act materiality is no longer reflected with a simple uh, settlement, which is the payment. We need to credit a lot of things, and I'm talking about the Mexican legislation. I'm talking about all the countries and the financial standards that must be sustainable, bulletproof, so to speak. So we need to have all the support, physical and material, of the that will give the guideline to a con internal control, and the legal act was true, and those legal act reviewed by a risk analysis because of deviation, mistakes, accidents, or for legal issues may fall, and also a sound transparency of a corporate governance. And in that government stems from the legislation analysis, and then this is what compliance means. Thank you very much. Mr. Justice, we have on behalf of Luis Manuel de la Mora Ramirez, the role of auditor in the validation, in the validation. Thank you, Carlos. Castro, uh, the presentation was really good, as always, very uh, illustrative. So I want to make this comment in the globalized world where the international laws tend to control. So you will see that every day we are 
more and more involved with the audit team. And the legal audit and compliance, we will need accountants, fiscal specialists to give the final recommendations to the customers. So we need to know the international treaties and to know the instances internationally wise so we can because they exist and our obligation is to convey this to the customers. Therefore, always remember that in our company, in our firm, there are specialists in different areas and they have to deal every day with international laws. So in this way, we can support our customers in this matter. Thank you, Vicente. Your presentation has been really good. The accountant career becomes a multidisciplinary career where we are involved. Not only uh, we need all a, a, a college organism to address all these issues. Our dear friend Manuel de la Mora, yes, the role of the auditor, the validation of corporate governments. But one of the proposals of the OECD and the best practices, uh, corporate best practices, when we were at school, we used to have the commission it as a support. The, the corporate government has a hierarchy. If they know that is something illegal, they have the power to stop it. So the commission it obliged it to participate. So if the company does not know about taxes or finances, so it is authorized to have advisors. It could be an auditor or an advisor. And the auditors, the committee of audit is set up. So it, uh, El Savan, the, the, La the Laxor Bones uh, was born because of the bad corporate governments and also the Arthur Anderson fall. So let's integrate, besides the report of the unique administrator of the board of directors, the report of the commissioner and the committee of valuation and remuneration, so they won't be paying millions to shareholders, executives, so the committee of the treasury will verify, validate the materiality of the act. The committee of planning will be like the customs for any product. So also the committee of audit that will receive all the reports and will draw conclusions. The reports of the commissioner that will be demanded. So, and also it should accept the third parties, vendors, creditors, banks, debtors. So the committee of auditing has to deliver a clean reception and the complaints uh, mailbox by protecting employees because the fifth interested is the employee and has to be protected against retaliation. And independent advisors, they will be participate through reports. So in compliance, the position of the auditor is essential in all the areas, not only in the area that we were used to, to, to audit fiscally. So we need to give the expert opinion by reviewing 
and taking all the reports of specialized area. The specialist in obligations compliance, the specialists in disciplines of all kinds, in the official Mexican norms or official norms. I don't want to talk about Mexico only. And then all the areas will go through the customs of auditors because their signatures and the different limitations is not the same, the scope of an internal audit compared to the external audit. So the audit grows a lot and the importance of the corporate governance and the compliance agreement is essential. I don't know, Manuel, if I answer your question or fail short. Thank you very much for your good presentation. Actually, no, thank you for your material. It was really helpful. You were very kind uh, to to give it to me. A part of what I said, I owe it to Aquilino. I don't think so. But your presentation was really good. The compared uh, law that tries to fill those legal voids. Well, there are some things that theoretically are academic, but we didn't get rid of them. And in your case, you considered them. Ya, ya no se oye. Ya no se oye, eh? Román. 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 Ya no se oye. Nada. No sé. Thank you, Hector Ruiz, for your comments. Thank you, Vicente. Your dissertation was magnificent. Uh, you ha you, your presentation was great. Congratulations. Thanks to you all. Uh, uh, accountant Orfavero, congratulations. Vicente. Accountant Vicente Diana Hernandez from Colombia. Uh, hugs, congratulations. Thank you. It was a very interesting analysis. Thanks, you all. So we will ask uh, Mrs. Orfa. So who will deliver this diploma? No se oye. Vicente, congratulations. Eric Peña will grant you this diploma, Eric, Eric, my dear friend Eric, wouldn't be better. Uh, good afternoon, Vicente. It's a great pleasure and an honor. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to grant you on behalf of UCCS this diploma for your excellent participation, for your interesting presentation of international treaties, international agencies, and constitutionality. There are things that we must know as accountants that we need to be like more knowledgeable about legality. So congratulations. And again, on behalf of UCCS America, we grant you this diploma, Professor Vicente Ortiz Justice, for your valuable participation as a speaker in the technical conferences cycles. OK, so please uh, keep all our diplomas, please. 
So when we see each other, you can hand those to everybody. So I will continue with the agenda. Thank you very much, Mr. Vicente Ortiz. For me, it's also a great pleasure to say hello to you. We have to be happy even if we see each other virtually. Hopefully, we will see uh, 